gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you all. I stand here just reflecting where I was on the 2nd of February, 1990, as an eight-year-old, living in Sophia Town, the domestic quarter where my mother was a domestic worker and my father was a clerk at the Vatterfall municipality. And I was schooling in Westbury Primary School. Homelands are in Umzumkulu, a totally different landscape. When we were in Johannesburg, we lived in a domestic quarter with water and electricity. And when we were back home just once a year, which is what my parents could afford, we lived in a big house with no water and electricity and no road to access the home. 34 years later today, is a reflection I will make later on. But this invite has made me to actually reflect, introspect, particularly in myself as a public servant in this democratic dispensation. It is my considered view that people from all walks of life in this country are invested in the success of our nation's democratic project and gatherings such as this one, which gives us an opportunity to interact with one another and exchange ideas on how to turn our nation's dream into a reality. I am therefore truly grateful to be a part of this conversation. And of course, we live in the legacies, part of which were left by the former president, F.W. de Klerk. I cannot imagine how difficult it was. As Mr. Trevor Manuel said, just four months into his tenure of presidency, the talk start for democratic South Africa. Now, to know how far we have come as a nation since the dawn of our democracy, and to know where we want to go, it is necessary for me to just briefly mention that we come from an era of the Immorality Act, the Population Registration Act, through the incredibly infamous Group Areas Act of 1950, the Suppression of Communism Act. South Africa's democratic era was hard fought for but various civil organization and political formations. Finally, declaring a democratic South Africa. Now, 30 years in, in April, South Africa's constitutional development since 1994 is unique in many ways but it shares some similarities with various other countries in the globe. <coughs> the transition from authoritarian rule, like Brazil, Indonesia, and Tunisia, amongst others. And in the case of a transition, which involved rigorous negotiations, and of course, when negotiations are involved, there has to be comp compromises. The ethnic diversity and nation building, countries such as India, Nigeria, and Malaysia share with South Africa the challenge of managing ethnic diversity and building a cohesive national identity. In each case, the constitution plays a crucial role in balancing the interests of different ethnic and cultural groups, promoting social cohesion and preventing ethnic conflict. The legacy of colonialism and discrimination, which we cannot forget because it is a foundation of what we see today, 
countries like Kenya, Zimbabwe, and Namibia have grappled with similar legacies of colonialism and discrimination as us. And in this case, the Constitution has been used to address historical injustices, promote reconciliation, and empower marginalized communities. Constitutional design and institutions. South Africa's constitutional design, including its systems of checks and balances, separation of powers, the protection of human rights, bears similar to countries such as Colombia, the Philippines, and South Korea, amongst others. And even in this circumstance, the Constitution serves as a framework for democratic governance and the rule of law. Challenges of implementation and enforcement which we face, like many emerging constitutional democracies, South Africa faces challenges in implementing and enforcing its constitution fully. These challenges include and are not limited to the factors of corruption, weakened institutions, socioeconomic disparities, and resistance from vested interests. Addressing these challenges requires sustained efforts to strengthen democratic institutions, promote accountability, and enhancing the rule of law. Now, our post-apartheid socioeconomic transformation efforts pursued by the government on behalf of the people have been substantial, but have fallen short of public expectations for more rapid change. These unmet expectations likely have contributed to section of society increasingly opting out of mechanisms that underpin democracy. From talking toward counselors, complaining to and engaging with institutions supporting democracy, such as the one that I come from, or seeking change through the political processes. Poor living conditions and frustrations arguably are a major factor motivating frequent, sometimes violent demonstrations known as service protests that have been part of the South African landscape for a number of years now. Many experts have maintained the view that large disparities in access of poor and vulnerable to some of the essential of life are, I quote, a constant and stubborn reminder of the unfinished business of our democratic project, I unquote, which amongst others must seek to reverse the legacy of apartheid policies that I quote, continue to underpin rural resident struggle for social production, I unquote. It is a worrying concern to the public protectors and institution and fellow institutions supporting democracy that so many of the social and economic factors that may constitute some of the underlying causes of the indifferences in the Southern Africa society are still so prominent, including poverty, inequality, and unemployment, incidences of racism exacerbated by the impact of COVID-19 pandemic and levels of corruption and maladministration. According to a new report released by the World Bank, inequality in Southern Africa, in our rainbow nation, is still the world's most unequal country. The report noted that COVID-19 pandemic is having a major impact on South Africa's economy, leading to a 6.4% contraction in 2020, as the pandemic weighed heavily on both external demand, even as the government implemented containment measures. This severe contraction is estimated to increase poverty, with two million people living below the poverty line for upper middle income countries. Now, if we look at the categorization of those people, they still remain black predominantly, and females in particular. Further, according to the World Bank, race is the largest contributor to inequality, and its contribution is growing. The legacy of apartheid continues to exacerbate economic disparities. Differences in educational attainment are the second most important driver in inequality, 
especially post-secondary and tertiary attainment, disparities in access to education, which is key to human capital accumulation, contribute about 30% to overall inequality. Disparities in empl employment outcomes are the third most important contributor to inequality. Another harsh reality, as I've mentioned earlier, is that women's realities in South Africa are still determined by race, class, and gender-based access to resources and opportunities. This is due to various challenges such as poverty, unemployment, and inequality. We've also seen the Sustainable Development Report that was released towards the end of last year, which also highlights poverty, inequality, and unemployment as one of the biggest social drivers in South Africa. Poverty is a social problem that affects both women and men in South Africa, and to a various extent, literature has established that many women live below the poverty line more than men, and more households are headed by women. The challenges have been plaguing our country since the advent of the new democratic dispensation, and some of the issues have still not been dealt with head on. The current state of affairs has a degenerative effect on the country's young democratic culture, and not only erodes the rights of citizens, but are contributing to the unprecedented levels of frustration and loss of trust in the democratic institutions, systems, and processes, which threatens to derail the democratic state. When the program, when one of the speakers actually was introducing the former Minister of Finance, he attributed some of the accolades that he had achieved as the Minister of Finance. We have regressed as a country since then. We are a relatively young and impressionable democracy, and our understanding of constitutional democracy and the rule of law is still developing. However, there are hindrances along the way. When governance and accountability and subsequently the relationship between citizens and the state is weak, this leads to an opt-out strategy, which citizens withdrawing from state services. Within such dysfunctional relations, citizens may totally opt out of the democratic accountability processes altogether and articulate their needs and demands through protest action and civil unrest which we continue to see. Despite often large investments and concerted policy efforts to improve things such as housing, public services in their generally infrastructure and the state's technical capacities, the delivery of public goods and services remains disconcertedly inequal and, and, and inadequate. Such problems disproportionately affect the most vulnerable members of our population, which not surprisingly also suffer from particular high rates of unemployment and low educational attainments. Unfortunately, we become the institution that, get, that gets to see this. According to our statistics, it is clear that the state of our country has a high rate of maladministration, abuse of power, conduct failure, undue delay. Now this threatens our democratic values, part of them of an accountable and a responsive government. However, it is promising to have seen the recent statistics re released by the Statistician General, which shows an improvement in the lives of the people. Great improvement in the provision of electricity whether it's lit or not, <laughs> even in water and housing. Now the living conditions in South Africa is that the social grants are on the increase. Personally, I do not think that is something to be proud of as a country. It is what leads to the decline in economy because it means that we are becoming a social state with most unemployed, underdeveloped. Sanitation has also improved. 
but whether we are in a state where we say we've restored the dignity of the majority of South Africans, we cannot say so. Although South Africa has made progress in reducing poverty since 1994, the trajectory of poverty reduction was reversed between 2011 and 2015, threatening to erode some of the gains made since our democratic dispensation. Approximately 55.5% of the population is still living in poverty at the national upper poverty line, while a total of 13.8 million people, 25%, are experiencing food poverty. Poverty, nonetheless, remains a key development challenge in social, economic, and political terms, not only in our country, but it is what most of the developing world is struggling with. In post-apartheid South Africa, fighting the legacy of poverty and underdevelopment has always been a central theme of government. This was cemented in the Reconstruction and Developmental Plan and the National Development Plan. However, what still remains a concern and probably part of the systemic challenges that we are facing is the issue of the equitable share model. It still finds that majority of the population migrates to the cities to seek a better life, clogging the infrastructure, development of informal settlements, and further poor living conditions in the cities. Whilst the rural areas still remain where the women and children are and the elderly, struggling for a better life. With municipalities <laughs> that do not have the share to afford to improve the conditions and create jobs in rural areas. Unintentionally, this kind of model still perpetuates the intentions of the apartheid regime. When we look at our governance system in South Africa, South Africa has held successful free and fair elections since its transition into democracy. Several sources highlight the negotiation period that heralded the transition and the importance of it for the establishment of a democratic culture in which electoral outcomes and basic political rights are respected. The transition is viewed positively in these accounts and considered as the anchor of South Africa's democratic political culture. However, if you look at our standing today, and reflecting on a video which we viewed two days ago at the Legislative Sector Summit of the negotiations, the vigor, the passion, the consultation which we, the transition was handled. If only we could just have, even if it's half of that, in our governance system today. South Africa's government has continued to implement varied programs ed aimed at creating social cohesion and nation building, yet social conflict persists, eroding le the legitimacy of government and the broader politic. However, this is caused by the characteristics that have embedded our governance and our government. The details of how this phenomenon developed have been extensively reported, but the main takeaway here is the corrosive impact of state capture, as previously mentioned, and societal relations. State capture presented characteristics of a state that didn't fall short of living or taking lessons on some of the former systems of this country, colonialism and apartheid, which took from its people. We saw that also repeating itself during the COVID pandemic, when there was not even a consciousness that people's lives are at stake. The livelihood and the right to life is at stake. The looting continued. We have witnessed and experienced that citizens and communities are not only frustrated by their socioeconomic circumstances, but by poor service delivery, 
standard and quality of the service delivery by leadership and lack of good governance by particularly the local authorities. Indicators of public dissatisfaction, particularly in municipality, have included several violent service delivery protests. Now this is another saddening phenomenon in our country where infrastructure is being destroyed. Now looking at the significant part of the mandate and the mission of the public protector, which we too will be celebrating our 30 year existence next year. We are not too proud even of our own legacy. However, we are rebuilding and efforts are being made because the public protector was established particularly to redress the imbalances of the past, to represent those who do not have the financial muscle and even the voice to represent themselves. We are the regarded as the pillars of this democracy to strengthen it and to support it. Now looking at the service delivery aspects, as I've mentioned earlier, the statistician general says there is improvements. We however continue to issue reports and one of them has been the report into the state of service delivery in the Eastern Cape, which gives us a picture that we cannot be very proud of. We human beings still drink in dams where animals drink. Definitely cannot be a democratic dispensation that we are proud of. Though we have made strides, we need to acknowledge that a lot still needs to be done. But I think the critical question that we need to ask ourselves as a citizenry, is it only government's responsibility to improve our lives. The ordinary people of this country continue to trust institutions such as ours, but also have a heavy reliability on civil society, business, investors into this country, to also play their part, but most importantly, to assist in holding the government accountable, to ensure that we've got a responsive government and there's openness and transparency in our democratic system. We are thankful in South Africa for having a free media, which at least assists in transparency and openness in, in our country. Yes, with its limitations too, there is no system that is perfect. However, pulling together in ensuring that we realize what is envisaged in our constitution, particularly the rights, human dignity, quality, the right to life. <clears throat> when we look at the report that we issued as the public protector, the state of the healthcare system in South Africa, can we say that the right to life is being upheld when the lives of those are still in rural areas, poor areas is not equal as the right to life of those who are abled. Now the endemic levels of corruption, which is one of the major factors that we can attribute the state at which we are at, of course not forgetting where we come from. Hadn't it been for corruption, the malfeasance that have characterized our democratic dispensation, which of course that our democracy borrowed from the previous dispensations of this country, the lives of the people of South Africa would have been in a far better state in, than what we currently report. Now in attaining the vision of the constitution as the foundation of our democracy, in bettering the lives of the people. Our constitution is a blueprint to a better life for all. It is the vanguard that protects the citizens from the people who are placed in power and indeed the citizens from one another. 
It serves it as the supreme law of the land, while simultaneously, I must add, quite masterfully echoing, as I quote, never again message. That is what the Constitution is about, that never again shall the people who are on the soil of South Africa be in the same position in which they were before. Can we confidently say that is the state of affairs currently? What needs to be done? From the perspective of the PPSA, it is absolutely crucial that citizens are able to respond to service or conduct failures by the state in a manner that reinforces institutions such as ours, the values as prescribed in our constitution, our ethical values and justice, social justice and economic justice attainment. It was through the erosion of the human character that we find ourselves in the position in which we are in. Hence, I agree that it is important that the people become a major contributor in who represents them. It is amongst the people in our society that our leaders come, and most of them elected, being known in those societies of not being people of character. So it is important that indeed our democratic dispensation sees itself at play by the involvement of the people, public participation, particularly as we move forward to the elections. Compliance with and respect of the rule of law. We have seen, even in this democratic dispensation, we've been grappling with the concept of compliance, particularly on the aspects of the rule of law. But as we move forward, without speaking on the next topic, it is important that we actually look at the ethical standing of our society. It is not written. It doesn't have a prescript. It doesn't have a legislation. We need to put in measures where the highest standard is that of character, not even the rule of law. The rule of law is prescribed. And now, mostly know how to comply without necessarily being of character and without necessarily doing what is good and without necessarily producing work which is ethical. Agenda and the call for action in the protection of promoting human rights. Even in the selection of public servants, both at the political and administrative level, it is critical that society scrutinizes and ensures that it is agents of this democracy who drive its aspirations. Now more than ever, these agents need to drive these aspirations with urgency. We cannot be at a more urgent and critical period, but now. In conclusion, allow me to acknowledge that South Africa cannot be described as a nation which has reached its full potential. And certainly, there is much to be said about what we all think and causes of that may be. The indicators of dissatisfaction and disappointment by the populace are well documented and certainly justified. It is up to us and how well we collaborate to continue to leverage on the good and courageous work in order to diminish the bad and the ugly. Good can only prevail over bad when we hold each other accountable to ensure good governance and ethical choices that will enhance our humanity. In gatherings such as these, we need not only share our experiences and thoughts, but to come up with sustainable solutions for a better future in a South Africa that is free from all the bad we have highlighted. In all of this, we must remain mindful that even with all that we have achieved, there remain considerable deficits in overcoming the legacy of discrimination and the grinding effects of poverty. The evidence of this confronts us with frequent regularity and the challenge we face as an institution and as a people 
is to ensure that the promise of the Constitution is made good and realized in substantial terms by the people. On 10 May 1994, in a ceremony that filled people across South Africa and around the world with hope, Nelson Mandela was sworn in as the President of the Republic of South Africa. He was not only South Africa's black, first black president, but also the first president chosen in a competitive free and fair elections. And in his inaugural address, Madiba declared, I quote, we have triumphed in the effort of implant hope in the breast of millions of our people. We enter into a covenant that we shall build the society in which all South Africans, both black and white, will be able to walk tall without any fear in their hearts, assured of their alienable right to human dignity, a rainbow nation at peace with itself and the world. The time for the healing of the wounds has come. The moment to bridge the chasms that divide us has come. The time to build is upon us. I unquote. As a country and as a nation, we can pride ourselves that we've been working hard and building. Our challenges remain because perhaps we might be underestimating the time it would take to dismantle the legacy of the past that brought us here. But through the recent crisis times that we as a nation had to endure, I have also witnessed our resilience, our drive, and our courage to build our new democratic dem South Africa, which is still a relatively short period of time in the history of nations. With our eyes firmly focused on the values and principles of our constitution as our strongest foundation, I'm in closing again reminded by Madiba's words in 1999 where he states, I quote, we have cause to draw inspiration from what South Africans can do we dare to hope for a brighter future because we are prepared to work for it. The steady progress of the past few years has laid the foundation for greater achievements, but the reality is that we can do much, much better, I unquote. Thank you.